Um, everyone, thank you so much for coming. Last session of today. I know it's hard. I wish I could bail on my own session uh, to go do something else, but unfortunately I can't. My name is Diogo. This is Riaz. We're on the security team at Docker. And today, we're going to be talking about secure substrate, the way that we actually get to least privilege deployment and orchestration. This morning, on the keynote, you saw a lot of demos. And one thing that was common to all the demos was how easy it was to run. In this case, a simple stack deploy allows you to get an application up and running using complex features such as secrets in a secure fashion deployed across a multitude of nodes, all with one command line. However, even though this is easy, that did not, does not mean that it's simple. And today, we're going to be talking about everything that goes inside to make sure that this command line and this command run securely. And as an analogy, I would like to use one of my favorite games, Tetris. Everybody loves Tetris. Tetris is a game in which you have multiple different pieces with different shapes and different colors. We call them tetronomos. The goal of the game is to make sure that all of the columns are full and there are no gaps, no spaces in between the pieces themselves. The reason why Tetris is like infrastructure security is because in infrastructure security, you also cannot leave any gaps because if you do, you now have vulnerabilities. In this talk, we're going to show you seven different tetronomos that we've built at Docker. Every single one of them, open source projects that we've built that can be used together or as different combinations individually to allow you to have specific security guarantees or together to allow you to achieve goals like having a fully secured orchestrator. The first Tetronimo is InfraKit, the way that we do machine management. Second Tetronimo that we're going to be talking about is going to be RunC. We're going to talk about RunC is our container execution. We're going to talk about ContainerD, the way that supervise RunC in execution. We're going to be talking about Docker itself and all the defaults and security um, features that actually comes with. We're going to be talking about Notary, the way that we do signing system, SwarmKit, a secure orchestrator, and I do not forget number two, Linux Kit, the latest Tetronimo on the Docker Tetris security family. This is the way that, you, that we allow you to build secure OSs. So to introduce you to the first Tetronimo, Rias. Thanks, Diego. So our first security Tetronimo is InfraKit, which provides infrastructure independent machine management. What this means is that InfraKit is platform agnostic. It works across your favorite cloud and also locally on your machine. And the way that InfraKit does this is through declarative updates. So your infrastructure is described as code in a JSON file, and with a single InfraKit command, you can update all of your infrastructure with a rolling update or provision new nodes. And this is very, very important to introduce something that we've been want InfraKit to enable, which we call reverse uptime. So many of you are probably familiar with the notion of uptime, where you count up from how long a machine has been provisioned as a measure of health. With reverse uptime, instead, we count down from a given time that we want a machine to live for. So in this example, 10 minutes. This is especially important for three reasons. First, OS drift. Over time, your OS may change configuration, and these changes in configuration may cause unexpected downtime in your infrastructure. So reverse uptime and constantly refreshing your machines with golden OS images prevents this. Second, you always want to make sure that your kernels are up to date because kernel updates provide important security patches to your infrastructure. And third, if an attacker happens to manage and open a back door in your infrastructure, reverse uptime and refreshing your, your infrastructure with a golden image removes any persistence from that back door and makes the attacker's life much harder. And InfraKit makes this super easy with rolling deploys. So InfraKit can be configured to remove OSs that have gone past their reverse uptime limit and reprovision a golden OS image 
in your infrastructure. Which brings us to Linux Kit, our next security Tetronimo that we unveiled this morning at the keynote. Linux Kit is the most secure OS builder for your containers. Linux Kit boils down to two main components, a secure kernel and hardened user space tools. On the kernel side, Linux Kit provides modern and securely configured kernels. The kernels themselves are configured with recommendations from the Kernel Self-Protection Project, and we have contributors to Linux Kit that are also providing patches to the Kernel Self-Protection Project in order to not only improve the security of Linux Kit, but also upstream, limit, upstream Linux. And this includes hardening uh, Berkeley packet filters and namespacing IMA. On the user space side, we've taken many of the user space tools and build chain tools from Alpine that are hardened for security, such as flags in the C compiler, and as well as system daemons like DHCP that we actually run in containers in a least privileged fashion, again, as you saw in the keynote this morning. And even though we have a minimal base, one of the core tenets of Linux Kit is to provide immutable infrastructure of that base. And so what that means in Linux Kit is that the root file system is read only. And what this means for attackers is that you have a much smaller attack surface because you cannot overwrite any important configuration or executable bits in Linux Kit based OS. And while Linux Kit was unveiled just this morning, it's already in use by millions of users. So if you use Docker for Mac, Windows, AWS, Azure, GCP, you've actually been using Linux Kit under the hood this entire time. And at Docker, we've been running Linux Kit in production and such, such that it's OSs it's produced are battle tested. Additionally, with Linux Kit, we not only want to improve kernel security now, but look ahead to the future and improve the security of the kernel with many exciting projects and incubate them in Linux Kit where folks can actually roll them out and test them in their environments. A couple I'd like to highlight are the landlocked Linux security module which leverages the new extended Berkeley packet filter kernel technology to provide a very fine-grained Mac control using Linux security modules, and WireGuard, which is a fast, modern, and secure VPN tunnel uh, which can revolutionize both container and host networking. And in addition, one other thrust that we really want to push forward with Linux Kit and with the community is to rewrite the system daemons in type-safe languages such as OCaml and Rust. Uh, OCaml is especially dear to us since we have a working Mirage OS, which is a unikernel-based builder example of DHCP already live today in the Linux Kit repo that you can use. Which brings us to RunC. RunC is a tetronimo that allows you to do container execution, one of the simplest pieces that we have in our whole tetronimo stack. RunC itself was created by Docker and donated to the OCI. Its goals are the inner details or to support the inner details of Linux runtime, uh, Windows runtime and supporting container execution itself. For example, it is the job of RunC to implement namespace isolation or to use the kernel's namespace isolation and to use the kernel's C group support. Namespaces allow your processes in your containers to have an isolated view of exactly what is happening, happening in the host and an isolated view from the rest of the containers that are executing on the same host. There's the PID namespace that actually allows you to not see the processes that are running on the host OS or on the other containers. The mount namespace, the IPC namespace, networking namespace, so on and so forth. As for C groups, C groups allow you to do resource constraints and isolate resource usage between all of your running containers that are running on the same host side by side. Which brings us to our next Atronimo, Container D. Now that we have the core runtime execution component, we need a container supervisor. So Docker created Container D, and we donated it to the CNCF. One of the major characteristics of container D that are relevant to security are the fact that it allows content addressable image pools. What this means is when container D wants to execute an image and run a container out of an image, 
If it's provided a secure hash of the content, then it can verify that the content that is pulled from anywhere on the internet is the content that you want to execute. The way that it does this is because the actual manifest, which is a file that describes all of the layers in a Docker image, is actually a Merkle DAG, a, direct a directed acyclic graph that hashes all the way to one hash, which is the hash of the manifest that, can, that we can then verify. We're gonna pick up on this hash a little bit later in this presentation. Which brings us to Docker, a secure by default software container platform that builds on top of RunC and Containerd. And while Docker has many security features, one I would like to highlight in particular are the number of security profiles that Docker brings by default out of the box. Firstly, Docker brings Linux security module profiles for both SE Linux and AppArmor, which provide Mac uh, control, so mandatory access control, over file paths, capabilities, and other syscalls for containers to keep them uh, least privileged. Second, Docker comes with a capability whitelist. So many, there are over 40 capabilities in the Linux kernel, of which about a dozen are granted to containers by default in a defined whitelist. And lastly, Docker has a syscall white whitelist, which you may know as seccomp, which whitelists the number of syscalls a container is allowed to run with by default, which greatly reduces the kernel attack surface. And so now that we have a container runtime, that brings us to Notary, our next Atronimo, which helps us with trusted software delivery for us to run our images in the runtime. Notary provides cryptographic name resolution. What that means is, for an image name, we can securely tie it to a unique identifier, a secure hash. Notary does this using signatures and is actually based on the Update Framework, which is a research project based at NYU, which is also based on Fandy, which is the original updating system for Tor, both of which have nation state level attacker type adversary threat models. Notary provides authenticity, integrity, and freshness guarantees over its signatures so you can trust the images that you're pulling down from any cloud or anywhere on the internet. Going further with signatures, Notary enables you to do threshold signing. What this means is you can have multiple collaborators with keys sign off on the same unique image identifier hash before an image is allowed to be deployed into a production environment. And if any one of these collaborators loses their keys by accident, Notary provides survivable key compromise so that the key can be easily rotated and replaced without changing the root of trust. This brings us to our final Tetronimo, SwarmKit. If you were at the keynote this morning, you've, you already heard me describe SwarmKit. But the goal of SwarmKit is the fact that you are not always in a situation where you have one host where you want to run a couple of containers. If you're in a distributed system and you have hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of nodes, you want to distribute the load across all of these different nodes in a secure fashion. This is what SwarmKit does for you. However, the reason why we made SwarmKit was the realization that having a secure orchestrator is not enough. What you need is an orchestrator that helps you secure your applications. And that was the goal of SwarmKit. So as you saw this morning on the keynote, we created something called Secure Node Introduction. With a simple token, you get to introduce a node securely into your swarm. This token is composed of four different parts. The first one is a known prefix. The sole purpose of this is for you to be able to grab through logs and through CVS version systems in GitHub to make sure that none of your developers committed it by accident. Very practical. The second one is equally practical, a version number for us to keep track of all the versions of tokens. But the third and the fourth one are the most important ones. The third one, the root hash, allows us to, when a node is being introduced, not having to do so based on trust on first use, or tofu, the same process that SSH goes through when it asks you if you want to accept a random fingerprint. You don't have to do that because the hash of the root CA is already in there. And the final component is the randomly generated secret that proves that this node has the authorization of joining the swarm with a certain role as a worker, unprivileged node, or as a manager, a swarm administration node. 
Solving the problem of node introduction brings us to the fact that we have to have strong identities to track these nodes throughout their life cycle. And this is where cryptographic node identities come into place. Every single swarm node that joins a swarm gets issued its own certific certificate with a random identifier. I'm putting the random identifier in a CN field inside of an X509 certificate represented over there by node ID. We also encode in the certificate itself the role of the node, in this case, a manager node. And finally, we also encode a swarm identifier to ensure that you can distinguish between multiple swarms. All of these certificates are constantly being rotated by the swarm managers, and you can bring down the expiration period of a certificate all the way down to one hour. This means that every hour, every single one of your nodes automatically rotates their certificates, which means that loss of a certificate by accidental backup leak or by committing something on GitHub that you shouldn't has um, average lifetime value for an attacker of 30 minutes. Now that we have certificates, we can actually go to the industry best standard or best practice around communication between any application and use mutually authenticated TLS between every single one of those nodes. But this is not just about encrypting the content. We actually use certificates for authorization between the nodes. What this means is that when a worker connects to a manager, the worker cannot pretend to be a manager because its rule is encoded in the certificate itself. Same thing for a manager. When a manager connects to another manager, it can prove that it actually has manager rights on the swarm because it has it encoded in its own identity. These permissions are stuck with the certificate, stuck with the identity, and they can't go anywhere. And so having this ability of having a secure way of distributing content throughout the swarm in an authenticated way allows, allows us to help your applications be more secure by building things on top, such as secure secret distribution. Where, as you saw on this morning's keynote, it is incredibly trivial for you to add secrets that get exposed to your applications as a file, so they are able to be used by any framework in any language in any application that you desire, but they only exist in memory. They only get delivered to the worker nodes that need them, and they get removed as soon as they're no longer needed. Least privilege, secure, secret distribution. But one of the features that I'm most excited about comes to prove the fact that SwarmKit is the world's most secure orchestrator. And it's a feature that you haven't heard before called transparent root rotation. For the security engineers in the crowd, there's a lot of academic, um, there's a lot of academic design that usually ends in a root of trust. This root of trust for a public key infrastructure, such as swarm kits, is, such as swarm kit, is usually the root CA private key and certificate. It's the certificate authority that you actually trust. However, the problem becomes when someone asks what happens if a manager node that has access to the certificate authority gets compromised? Or what happens if somebody compromises a backup with my certificate authority? And usually the answer that security engineers give you is this. For us, that's not enough. And even though there is no way of guaranteeing that a malicious attacker that seals a private root key cannot cause mayhem in a system, we can severely limit the amount of exposure that your system has. And that's what we did. SwarmKit allows you to have transparent root rotation. What that means is that if you're no longer happy with your root of trust, you can simply add a new one. You can actually rotate transparently the root of trust for your certificates. Let me walk you through this. There's effectively four steps. On the, one, on the first one, you have a manager and workers all trusting the blue lock, which represents a blue certificate authority. In step number two, you introduce the red root of trust. And the manager now issues certificates for itself with a new root of trust, and now trusts both the blue and the red. In the third step, the manager goes throughout all the nodes and forces them to do a certificate rotation, issuing them certificates with a new root of trust, but not telling them to swap the trust just yet. And now, in the fourth step, now that all the nodes in the cluster trust both the new and the old CA and have certificates issued by the new CA, we can go and remove the old one, removing completely the exposure of a compromised certificate authority. 
Features like this, we believe, are what makes SwarmKit really exciting. But we talked about individual pieces, individual tetronomos, all with its own specific goal. But our goal was to deploy apps securely, was not to do infrastructure security. So how can we bring this all together? How do these tetronomos join together, provide certain specific features that are interested to you? Well, what happens if we bring together Notary and Docker? What you get is you get secure name resolution, cryptographic verified pools. What this means effectively is if you have a Docker image on the left, you can sign it with a potentially offline root key and your production systems all the way on the far right can actually verify it without trusting the cloud. You could literally host the content on an HTTP mirror and the pool and execution of the content on your production server would still have all the guarantees that Notary provides you. What if we join SwarmKit with Docker? Well, we obviously get the ability of having authenticated, authorized, and encrypted delivery of resources. Secrets, yes, but also configurations, ensuring that no malicious attacker can listen in the middle or do man in the middle or wreak havoc in your swarm. What if we join InfraKit and SwarmKit? Well, we get the ability of doing secure node introduction in itself. The way that secure node introduction works is in three simple steps. The first one is using the token that I've described on the previous slide, you can retrieve and validate the public certificate authority of the cluster that you're joining. Number two, the worker sends only public key material to the managers. And number three, the manager signs with the certificate authority and returns a cryptographic identity. This is what we get by joining these two pieces. What if we use Linux Kit as the base OS builder for Docker? Well, not only do we get the security of Linux Kit itself, but we also get additional hardened configuration for Docker. The reason for this is, as you saw in the keynote, we run Linux Kit, builds an OS that runs all of its system daemons, in this case including Docker, in containers. So we can drop capabilities from Docker, leverage namespaces, and basically run Docker in a hardened fashion with hardened configuration. What if we use Lin Notary with Linux Kit for secure dependency resolution? Well, again, since Linux Kit brings together its component as Docker images, we can leverage Docker content trust for a cryptographically verified build where every dependency is pulled down and its signatures are verified before bringing it into a Linux Kit based OS. And once we have an OS, what if we use InfraKit and Notary to help provision it? Well, we can use a very interesting feature in Linux called DM Verity, which provides basically a snapshot of the system state down to the block level and ties it to a hash. This hash is verified, and if the hash doesn't match this, the state of the system, you have, a, you have an inoperable system, one that cannot actually have any reads or writes. So we can combine Linux Kit with DM Verity and want to ha get this hash. But how do we get the hash? Well, InfraKit can be our remote OS provisioner and provide the DM Verity root hash on boot time. But how do we know how to trust this hash in the first place? Well, we can use Notary, which provides us cryptographic name resolution, and we can tie the hash to signatures to provide to InfraKit to provide to Linux Kit for DM Verity. What if we go all the way and start combining run C with container D and Docker? What do we get here? Well, we get a secure by default container execution environment. You get secure defaults, secure APIs, and you get the ability to execute containers knowing that you have the best practices of container security in it. What if we go one step further? What if we further add SwarmKit and Notary to the mix? Well, this is starting to look complex, but what you actually get here is you get a secure by default container platform. You get the ability of executing containers on a multitude of nodes using authentication, authorization, and encryption, all backed by mutual TLS and all the nice features that SwarmKit actually provides you. And now the obvious question is, what do we get when we join all the pieces together? Well, the first thing to notice is there are no gaps. This is actually solid. 
from a Tetris perspective, this is a good game. And what we actually get is we get the ability of having secure by default infrastructure, remotely attested node joins, the ability of having um, introduction of nodes, cryptographic node identities, secrets being delivered in a least privileged way to a cluster where you are sure that the nodes that were introduced are running the kernel that you wanted with the minimal kernel that was built that follows all the security best practices such as read only and default isolation principles. This is what you get. And to show you every single one of these seven tetronomos working together, Riaz is going to give you a demo. Great. All right. Here I have my two screens. On this screen I have a swarm of one, a single manager running on a Linux kit based OS. And on this screen here, I'm going to securely add a node to my cluster and deploy a service. So as we saw in the keynote this morning, I have my YAML file that specifies the Linux kit based OS I want my swarm worker to run. So I can show you. So what it looks like very similar to this morning. I'm going to use Moby build on this YAML file to build my worker OS. And again, we're similar output to this morning, but now you know that all of these images that we're pulling in to build our artifact are signed and verified with Notary combined with Linux kit before we get our final output. So it's going to go for a little further. We're going to get our output. Great. Now I have my command line init rid bz image. Now I have also a swarm.json configuration file that I'm going to use with InfraKit. So in this file, I've defined my swarm workers, and right now I have zero of them. So I'd like to add one, which is going to be this node. I'm going to commit, so I'm going to add this. Oops. And all I need to do is InfraKit group commit swarm.json. And great, committed swarm managing two instances. So now, to show you what's happening under the hood, I'm going to Moby run the disk, my worker node. So we'll soon see the boot. This is the kernel booting up. Again, it's our modern, securely configured kernel. And very shortly, we'll see the InfraKit plus Notary plus Linux Kit DM Verity integration. So here it is. I've added some prints with DM Verity setup. Very soon we will see the hash that the system reports of its own state, of its own blocks, which we have here, the root hash, as well as the DM Verity notary provision hash, which matches, so we're good here, which it provided to InfraKit, which is providing to our Linux kit builder, and now we have a shell. And to show you that this is read-only, uh, yeah, touch test, read-only file system, so immutable infrastructure, and as I mentioned, Docker is actually running in a container. So our Docker. And I have Docker. And it's joined a swarm with this node ID. That's this cryptographic node identity. If I look at my manager side, I see the same node, the same ID. So it's successfully joined our swarm. It has its own cryptographic node identity, and they're talking over mutual TLS. So now that I have my swarm, Let's deploy something. So I have my app here. I'm just going to do a simple docker stack deploy. Just like we saw this morning, docker stack.yaml, which has our secrets, our configuration, and we'll start our service. And very soon, on this node, start seeing services. There we go. Start seeing some, some tasks scheduled to this node. And so there it is. I joined a node to our swarm using a Linux kit based OS, securely joined our cluster, and we have a secure service. Perfect. So you saw every single. <laughs> Thank you, demo gods. <laughs> you saw every single one of these Detronimos work together. So as a summary, you have InfraKit, the way that we do machine management. Booting um, Linux Kit OS that has been hardened by default to run on the cloud and run containers. Executing Run C, supervised by ContainerD, brought together by Docker with secure defaults. 
that then only executes images that have been verified by notary and every single thing orchestrated by SwarmKit securely. So all of these pieces, what do they do when they come together? They create a secure substrate. Moby. Thank you very much. And because we wasted 20 minutes of our lives doing this animation, I'm going to do it again. <laughs> Moby. Test, test. All right, thank you very much. That was awesome, especially that animation at the end. Uh, so we'd like to open up the floor for some questions. I'll ask that you just kindly line up in this aisle so I can pass down the microphone so everybody on the live stream can also hear the question as well. The floor is yours. I think it's great that you've done and have everything tied together, but do you leave enough room for other people to play and get in the mix, things like Kubernetes for orchestration versus Swarm? And how do you see that evolving over time? Thank you for the question. The way that we see this is we're constantly putting out pieces individually. You saw seven different tetronomos. These are only the current secure tetronomos that are in use. So there's a lot of work in refactoring a lot of the pieces in SwarmKit to actually provide you all these guarantees as individual blocks, such that, for example, you could run your own orchestration system. You could actually have orchestrated containers being orchestrated by Kubernetes, but having the backing of the Node ID, secure introduction, mutual TLS, and having encrypted secrets on top of Kubernetes, and having Kubernetes just do the actual orchestration. So we see this as Tetris. We see this as Lego. It's an actual assembly of different components that you have to bring together in the way that you want, not necessarily in the way that we prescribe it. I have, a <clears throat> I have a medium mean question. Um, so the root of rust rotation, the root of trust rotation, was really really cool. Um, the way you described it, it made it sound like you have to trust the root of trust to trigger rotation of itself. But if, in the case of a compromise, how can you trust the compromised root of trust to rotate itself? And if and, and subsequently, is there an expectation that the root of trust will expire and what happens if it doesn't rot its, rotate itself before the expiry? Thank you for the question. This was not planned, but it's a great question. The reason why we believe that SwarmKit is doing something different is because if you think about this, that's an excellent question. You trust a root. If this root gets compromised, how can you trust that the next root is actually trusted too? The reality though is that security engineers have this problem, which is security nihilism. Just because in an academic fashion, you can't do in the worst attacker model where the attacker has access to all of your infrastructure and your root key and gets to simultaneously push updates on your networks to every node, just because that specific attacker model is impossible to solve, which in this case, it really is, it doesn't mean that all the normal situations where these things happen, that's the situation where we're on, which is not. Imagine the case of a backup. The backup has a root key. The attacker now has your root key, but no, it doesn't have access to, does not have access to your infrastructure. Which means that if I provide you a way to do root rotation that is seamless, that is transparent, and that is fast, you can just race ahead of the attacker and simply eliminate the threat. Think of this for every single other scenario. Like, even if you're in a situation where you're competing with the attacker for the ability to actually manage the cluster, I now give you a tool to be able to actually remove the threat of any keys that get leaked. So this is why we don't think of when you get to a situation where, oh, the root of trust, if it's compromised and the attacker has access to all the infrastructure constantly on the network, we can't do anything. In our case, we say, let's do the best that we can and let's provide the ops people with the ability of actually recovering from the normal situation, which is you didn't get hacked by a nation state attacker, but you just lost your private key. As for the second part of the question, if the root expires, this is the perfect mechanism for you to rotate it very easily before the root expires. Also, if you think about it, from a cluster perspective, this is also a really easy way for you to jump in and out of having Swarm managing your PKI. Swarm manages your PKI, but if you want to have certificates being issued by your remote third party system that you already have in your system, then you rotate it out to the PKI on the outside, and now if you don't want to be the PKI on the outside to, to, to manage your certificates anymore, you rotate it back in into Swarm. 
and you get to do as many times as you want. Uh, swarm kit and the token. So when uh, these tokens are obviously really important, right? They authenticate nodes and then they authorize them to join the swarm. Do you have any recommendations, best practices for getting those tokens onto new machines? Yes, so this is where we actually need cloud help and cloud support. And this is the reason why InfraKit is there in the first place. So we understand that secure node introduction has that specific node or that specific uh, token as the root of trust to join a system. This is why InfraKit takes care of all of that for you and actually does already the secure behavior and the secure thing, which is uses all the cloud's different mechanisms to store keys and to secure the transmit data to nodes to make sure that all the node joins and scaling up and down are done in a secure fashion. Well, like drop it into, for example, use KMS and then? For example, use KMS, for example, use whatever Azure provides, GCP, metadata, so on and so forth. Fancy. About InfraKit, um, how long has it been around and how mature is it compared to, say, like, like Ansible or Terraform or those other guys? You want to take that one? Sure. Uh, so InfraKit was open sourced in October, I believe. Um, so that's, it, it has been used before that yes. it's in Docker, so it wasn't our first time using it. I guess you have any additional? We already use it for yeah. additions. Yep. It is the way that we're actually managing uh, GCP clusters. So InfraKit is actually, if you're using right now Docker on uh, Google Cloud, you're actually using our, uh, you are infra using InfraKit on the underlying uh, feature. And if you do out of scaling and scaling down, that is all uh, InfraKit um, being able to spin up nodes and down. Now, InfraKit in that particular situation right now is not doing, for example, the remote attestation piece, but it will eventually, that's the goal. Cross-platform, cross-cloud, the same security. All right, thank you very much. Uh, it doesn't look like there are any more questions, so we can close out the session here. Uh, don't forget you can vote for all of your favorite breakout sessions, and the highest rated ones will get a repeat session on Thursday. So don't forget to vote. Vote for these guys, Riaz and Diogo. And let's give them another round of applause. Thank you.